Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Simeon Diankov, and I'm the policy director of the Financial Markets Group at the London School of um, Economics. Um, we are very honored today to have with us Dr. Eugenio Kozunak, who is the Director General of the Public uh, Property Agency of the Republic of uh, Moldova. We will be discussing uh, public property and its management, but we will also discuss uh, the more general topic of uh, the refugee crisis resulting from the war in Ukraine and how uh, Moldova is handling its influx of, uh, of uh, refugees. Um, as you have followed uh, the events over the last a bit more than two months, uh, by now more than five and a half million Ukrainian refugees um, have uh, left the country and are residing in some of the neighboring countries, including uh, Moldova, which is a percentage of the population has received the most, uh, the largest share of uh, refugees, which has created, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of difficulties for um, the government and its agencies. So this is what we'll be discussing, uh, discussing today. Um, before we go there, some uh, housekeeping. We are recording this uh, session and subject to um, not experiencing technical difficulties, we will make it available um, as a podcast uh, soon after this uh, recording. Uh, as we are operating through several platforms, we'll be collating uh, questions, uh, myself and several colleagues who are working uh, on this uh, event. So the questions will come to me, please, uh, directed to me, and I will be putting them together and then, uh, and then uh, directing them towards our, uh, our speaker. So if you want to ask a question, please type it in the chat box. Um, and then if you're on Twitter, on Facebook, or any of the other platforms, uh, please again, send your questions. Uh, our team will be uh, putting them together. Uh, we have a Twitter account and Twitter following to this um, recording and to this uh, event. It's uh, hashtag FMG uh, Moldova Ukraine. Um, so um, we are looking forward to your uh, comments. Um, our speaker has uh, quite a diverse um, uh, biography. He holds a doctorate in education from Vanderbilt University here in uh, the United States. He also has an MBA from Grenoble University and a Master's of uh, Divinity. But in addition to this uh, illustrious academic career, he has uh, been very successful as an entrepreneur, as an investor uh, with uh, equity in uh, technological and technology companies. He has done military duty, including um, uh, service in the Middle East. And of course, perhaps now he's facing one of his uh, uh, biggest challenges in his uh, career so far with uh, the influx of uh, refugees from Ukraine and what that implies for, um, for public policy in Moldova, for the ability of the government to uh, react to this, uh, to this uh, significant challenge and really what it implies for the future of the country and the future of, um, of Europe. Uh, Eugenio has a presentation, so we will listen through this presentation. As you do, please uh, think of questions and send them to uh, us uh, in advance so we can uh, organize ourselves. And then we'll have about uh, half an hour for questions and uh, answers. Uh, with this, Eugenio, the floor is, uh, is yours, please. And we're very happy to have you with us. Thank you. Can you see the slides well? Yes, it looks very good. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be in this uh, in this place with you in this virtual location. But uh, it's good to know that there are people who care for the people of Ukraine. Um, and I'd love to share you with you some of my experience of working with Ukrainian refugees through this 
through this crisis in the neighboring country. I also want to share some of my experience of managing on this end, the, the crisis management team, but also uh, share some of the things that uh, Moldovans have been doing and also present maybe a way forward and give you a bit of sense of what's going on and what have we learned from this experience. So I'll talk briefly about the Moldovan context of this conflict, uh, a little bit about the public property agency that I lead. And we'll talk about the influx of refugees at the initial stages and how the PPA addressed some of the challenges of managing the flow of refugees in the country, but also looking at what's next and what have we learned uh, going forward. So a little bit about me. Uh, thank you, Simeon, for your initial presentation. I am the Director General of the Public Property Agency in the Government of the Republic of Moldova. Uh, I am Moldovan, though I spent most of my adult life in the United States. And before joining the Moldovan government, my professional life varied from nonprofits uh, to corporate, uh, corporate work, marketing, business development, uh, product management, uh, some military, some recruiting, just a variety of various activities. Um, and my initial education was in Moldova, but with graduate degrees um, in France and the US. And until last August in 2021, I was uh, living very comfortably with my wife and three children in the beautiful city of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, but a call from the prime minister of Moldova I changed all that and led me to uh, the point of being here with you today. And uh, last summer, uh, something very important happened in Moldova, and that was the the election of a pro-Western parliament. Already a, uh, a president was elected in December of the previous year, was pro-Western, um, and together with a new president, with a new parliament, a new government was formed in August of 21. And this is the first time that I felt that the values and the perspective and the goals of this government aligned with my values, my desires for Moldova, and it was the right time to come back. And so a personal call from the Prime Minister of Moldova, Natalia Gavritsa, asking me to lead the uh, public property agency really sealed this deal for me, and I jumped on the plane and, and got here. So I want to tell you a little bit about Moldova, and uh, what I want to tell you about Moldova is that there are some things that are not going to be on the slide. These are the headlines that you typically see in newspapers and magazines when they talk about Moldova, at least prior to February of this year. You typically find out that Moldova is the poorest country in Europe, that uh, it was part of the Soviet bloc, that in some reports it is ranked as the unhappiest uh, country in the world. Uh, but that's how the media uh, likes to summarize this. And I've chosen a phrase that's become popular in light of recent events. It's a small country with a big heart. Uh, it is so named because we've absorbed the highest number of Ukrainian refugees per capita. And I want to orient you a little bit on this map that you see on the right. The capital city is Chisinau, uh, and it's in the very center of the, of the country. On the western border with Romania, uh, it runs along, along the Prut River, creating a natural boundary between Romania and Moldova. And in the eastern part of Moldova, the yellow area is called Transnistria. It's called that because there's a Nistru river running along that border. So anything beyond the river, beyond the Nistru is Transnistria. And Transnistria is officially part of Moldova, uh, but it has declared itself independent in 1992. And for the last 30 years, even though it's uh, Moldovan territory. Uh, it has been aligned with the Russian Federation. It's been supported by Russian Federation. It's been secured by Russian troops. And in the south of Moldova, there is an autonomous area of Gagauzia. Moldova is home to about 2.6 million people. Um, and you can see on the bottom, the ethnic breakdown here with the obvious majority being Romanian. And from a linguistic perspective, 78% uh, of people speak Romanian as their native language. About 14% speak Russian and 12% speak Ukrainian at home. But Russian is readily used 
in many parts of Moldova, and most Moldovans would typically speak Russian as well, though it's slowly changing with the new generation choosing to speak other languages, English or French, and uh, less Russian. But Transnistria, which I mentioned earlier, in the east of Moldova, has uh, fewer than half a million people, and the majority there speak Russian and Ukrainian, uh, and only about a third of the population there speaks Romanian. If I had to describe the first 10 months of the Moldovan administration's uh, term, uh, led by Prime Minister Antalya Gavritsa, you can see her speaking from the parliament podium on the bottom left. Uh, I would say that all of the uh, members in the cabinet, all of the leaders of national agencies feel like we're, we're fighter fighters. We're continually handling crisis after crisis, uh, putting one fire after another uh, with a sort of continuous effort to stop this avalanche of issues. Uh, even though the government had to deal with the tail end of the COVID pandemic, tough negotiations with the, uh, with the Russian authorities for natural gas, gas supply, really nobody in this administration expected that we would add a war to the list of challenges that we would be dealing with. And so on the morning of February 24th, I woke up to the sounds of bombs exploding in the distance. The Russian forces attacked a number of military installations on the Ukraine-Moldova border. But this was not a new sound to me because I've heard it 30 years ago during the Transnistrian War when that region declared independence and allied itself with Russia. When the Russian-backed separatists uh, established that self-proclaimed republic, they bombed the house uh, where my family lived where I lived as a teenager. And it's estimated that about, uh, about a thousand people died in that war, were killed in the war, and about 3,000 were wounded. We had to leave our home on uh, around March of 1992 and live as refugees in government provided housing in the capital city for about six months. So uh, Moldova, as you can see, is not surprised by Russian aggression. Uh, it was a repeat of something we've witnessed many years ago. We just did not expect it to happen at this scale with our neighbors in the same kind of scenario. Within Moldova, uh, my role is uh, the director of the public property agencies, as I mentioned, which puts me in charge of about uh, 25 to 30 percent of our national economy uh, with the companies in 17 different industry verticals. And to give you a little history of the agency, uh, we need to travel back a little bit in time for a moment to the USSR, keeping in mind that the state back then owned absolutely everything. So when the Soviet Union fell apart and Moldova gained its independence, the new government began to privatize property and industry and land, but not everything was privatized. And so today, roughly about 30% of the economy is still publicly owned, state owned. And in 2017, the uh, agency for public property or public property agency became that umbrella holding uh, agency for all of state property, state owned enterprises, as well as all of the public lands. At the start of the war, uh, on uh, immediately after the government declared a state of emergency on February 24th in the evening. The declaration of state of emergency enabled the government to make dec decisions through exceptions to established laws. So any exception would be essentially in effect only for the duration of the state of emergency. And as soon as the state of emergency ends, we revert back to regular legislation. So, for example, it was clear to us that refugees would be coming in without the time to make passports and pick up all the documents they needed. They, they, take, they took their children and they rushed to the border with whatever they could grab on the way. And sometimes they would show essentially pictures on their phones of their birth certificates or passports. And so even though regular legislation wouldn't allow for that, uh, the, emergency state, the committee for emergency situations provided for that ability to let Ukrainian refugees enter the country with minimal requirements. 
And uh, even this morning, we had another meeting of the of this committee where we decided yet another uh, set of rules to allow Ukrainians to travel back to Ukraine easier. And so as the administrator of all public lands and buildings, it was my responsibility in this crisis management team to identify and prepare the space for refugee centers. Ideally, we were looking for shelters that had adequate uh, space for beds, for showers, for toilets, for food and laundry services. But when we ran out of these ideal options, we started looking for adequate spaces with just enough space for bed, some food nearby, uh, the ability for NGOs to come and provide for basic uh, hygiene facilities for portable bathrooms and showers. And uh, at that time, it was actually a pretty cold time of the year. So we had to ensure that there was heating available, that we could have some kind of heating units provided for those spaces. Most of us in the crisis team um, that was set up by the government initially uh, were essentially running uh, 24 hour operations. We had some of our deputies replace us, but essentially working 12, 20 hour days uh, 20, and seven days a week uh, for that time period. Uh, here's a picture of the, the first uh, crisis management team made up of a couple of ministers, uh, a couple of deputy ministers. I see the prime minister's chief of staff is on the left, the latest standing, and the, uh, the uh, chancellery uh, secretary general is uh, taking the, the selfie for us. This was probably around 11 or 12 o'clock at night and just working nonstop trying to get information of what's coming from the border. What do we need to do? What do we need to set up uh, for these uh, refugees as, as they were coming in? The first obvious location for a large refugee center was the International Exhibition Center called Mold Expo. This is one of the companies in my portfolio and they have three large pavilions uh, for event hosting. But providentially, two of these large pavilions had previously been converted to be overflow facilities for COVID patients for this pandemic period. And they had already beds, as you can see on the left, with some basic room partitions. There hadn't been a COVID patient since October of last year, but the beds and the furnishings remained and so we directed the initial loads of buses of refugees to these locations. And about 450 people were housed in this area. And I checked today and there are 360 people at Mold Expo uh, right now. The, there's a third pavilion, which was later co converted into a donation processing center. And today it hosts the UNHCR operational team. The next day after the, the war started, the Minister of Interior uh, called all representatives of nonprofit organizations to the Ministry of Interior. And we had a meeting trying to figure out how do we organize a call center? How do we set up a website that would track all information and how all refugees can access immediately the information to understand how they can keep going on? How can they find transportation, housing, how can they reconnect with one another? How do they get support, food, and any other information for crossing borders or any other legal information that they needed? The slogan for this new group of volunteers was called Moldova Pentrupaci, which means Moldova for peace. And as I walked around different centers, I took some of these pictures. Uh, I like this picture on the right of these guys, volunteers. They didn't want to have their faces shown for pictures because that's not where they, they were there for. But I love the writing on the back of their um, little overalls that said, uh, I help, I care. Uh, these are the two words that um, they were essentially showing why they're there for. And <clears throat> almost immediately, people started using all of their skills to set up uh, either through technology, through call centers, through websites, um, or organizational skills to make sure that, um, that refugees knew where to go, knew where to find help. And right now on the upper left, you can see the site dopamoga.gov.md, which serves as the ongoing hub for all information um, for refugees. The flood of refugees um, required us to continually look for more spaces. 
The state-owned enterprises were used uh, as well in this process, such as the a hotel uh, Zarea in the city that has 100 rooms. And there's also a healthcare facility, outpatient healthcare facility called Constructoral that also had 100 rooms. So we converted those locations immediately for places for families with children. In this picture, you see the prime minister with the head of Mall Telecom visiting one of the facilities, which is a conference center outside the city, uh, somewhere in, the, in a forest area. Uh, and they came, they prepared it, and literally probably two hours later, several busloads arrived uh, with um, about over 120 refugees uh, to populate it. But one unexpected development was really the hospitality of the Moldovan population. Uh, they welcomed the refugees into their homes and gave literally everything they could. Um, if, you, if you were to go to the border, uh, you wouldn't hear sort of Moldovans talking about refugees. They're talking about house guests. They were inviting people into their homes and the nearby villages immediately swelled with, uh, with refugees uh, living there. Um, and in fact, my own, if, for me, I took two families uh, to live in one of my apartments. Uh, for the past two months, and actually a new family moved in this past weekend. Uh, but if you look at the numbers of where the refugees today are housed in Moldova, 90%, over 90% of them are in people's homes, and only about 10% are in various shelters and housing centers. Uh, but even with this overwhelming hospitality, it's difficult to find homes and hotel rooms when so many thousands of people come in, and that's where the state companies became the initial hosts uh, because they could offer that large scale operation and housing. One of these examples of a large scale uh, housing place is the athletic center called Manej, which has an indoor competition racetrack and is used for various athletic events. And in one of the early days, uh, you may have read this on the LSE blog, that Simeon and I wrote about the early experience in the managing of re the refugee crisis. We told a story where uh, one of the early days we got a phone call from the border saying that there were, there were several buses heading to the, cities, uh, to the city. It was past midnight. Uh, and so what we did was we called on the railway to see if we could use their beds that they typically would use in sleeper cars. And so we had to find somebody around midnight, 1 a.m. to go open up the warehouse that had all those mattresses. Then we called the army to come in and help us carry these things. But we needed transportation. So one of the wineries, Krikova Winery, provided a couple of trucks and the, the thermo, uh, thermoelectric power plant provided some of the trucks as well. And then we had the administrators open up this indoor arena. So all this was taking place somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. In a, in a really quick operation. And the beds were set up uh, so fast that when people arrived, they could come in, they could lie down, um, take a breath of air and just rest, get some food and figure out what to do next. The, the, the outpouring of support from the local population uh, also includes the, the diaspora, Moldovans from all over Europe, uh, U.S. and Canada started saying, how can we send all the supplies? What can we do to help um, our compatriots basically managing uh, this crisis here? Uh, there were vans being loaded in London, in Italy, uh, and traveling to Moldova with various supplies. So we started saying, how can we set up these donation uh, reception and processing centers? So we took several companies and used their space to set up these refugee centers. One of them was at the railway event center uh, in one area of the city. We used the technical university in another and uh, Mold Expo had one center as well. And here you see the film studios of Moldova Film, which you can see uh, very large spaces to create film sets, but we used them and converted them into donation reception centers. But then one day somebody said, wait a minute, what are we gonna do with all this stuff? Let's put it on pallets. So glass factory uh, came and just bought truckloads of wood uh, pallets in order for us to organize everything that was being donated. 
then we used the postal service that realized that they had trucks delivering the mail, but coming back empty. So they could start using some of the space in their cargo vans to be able to transport some of these donations. Uh, we had metal processing plants uh, provide some of their accountants, wineries providing transportation, Mall Telecom went to the border and handed out tens of thousands of SIM cards with unlimited internet and started and also provided the technology, the setup for the call centers for the refugee and, uh, vol and the volunteer hub. So all these companies immediately used their resources to take care of the ongoing and immediate needs of very large groups of people. As we started to realize that the amount of people that were coming into the capital city were overwhelming the city resources that were available. And a large, large number of people, about half the people that, come, that were coming in did not wanna stay for more than a few hours. They wanted to keep going uh, further and only, only less than half wanted to stay for longer periods of time to try to figure out if they wanna come back, is the war gonna end? Or do they need to keep moving uh, forward? So we realized that we needed a way to bypass the capital city and get people to the other side of the country to Romania faster. So the railway pulled their trains and sleeper cars to the, and they brought them to the closest point to the Ukrainian border and waited till midnight for the train to load so that people can stay in sleeper cars, get the rest, so they didn't have to have another logistical stop in the capital city, but they could stay on the train and they were taken straight to Romania. Um, so the railway was able to provide that on a short notice. And to give you a visual of, of the flow of refugees into the country, this is the full graphic of Ukrainians arriving and Ukrainians leaving with lighter blue. And the dotted line that goes through the graph is the number of Ukrainian nationals remaining in Moldova. And as of today, there are not, about 93, 94,000 people in the country. So some of the numbers uh, to give you an overview of some of the statistics, uh, over 440,000 people have entered so far. And if you look at the population of Moldova of 2.6, that's about 16, 17% of the population coming through in a very short period of time, crossing the city, the, the country, and, uh, and using the resources and needing help to keep going on their journey. Uh, about Half of the people that are staying here right now are children, 6% are elderly, and there have been 7,000 people who requested asylum, asylum applications, while the rest of the people are still not sure what they're going to do, where they're going to go. There are 98 uh, official housing centers, shelters, that were certified by the government and are receiving information from them and receiving support from the government. In about uh, a quarter of these centers, there are people with disabilities and about 4% have uh, with serious illnesses. In 19, 20% almost of centers have women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Uh, and you, as you can tell, there are some challenges that we hadn't thought of uh, initially as, as we um, learn how to deal with the situation. To give you a very brief overview of the situation of these children. So 595 children have been enrolled in preschools, uh, to over 1200 of them have enrolled in schools. But the majority of Ukrainian children are actually participating in the online education provided by Ukraine. And people who chose to send their children to Moldovan schools, uh, of them 120 children about are studying in Romanian, so they're learning the language and they're going to Romanian schools while the rest have chosen to study in Russian. But the closer people are to the capital city, more of them tend to go to local schools, at least for some of the programs, while continuing online distance education uh, from Ukraine. But further away from the city, almost all Ukrainian children are in this online program. About 3,000 refugees sought medical help, uh, medical care as they arrived, and 1,100 refugees needed hospitalization uh, as they came in. Some of the more serious cases were taken from the border and transferred to Romania, as, as was the case with premature babies 
who were transported from the Palanca border to the city of Hush in Romania. In addition to COVID, refugees had been treated for injuries, for malnutrition, for dehydration, tuberculosis, cancer, kidney failure, as well as uh, well patient treatment like those routine, like routine pediatric visits and obstetrics. And 82 Ukrainian nationals have been born on Moldovan territory. As you can sort of imagine that refugees arrived, haven't been prepared for the situation, but also had in some cases, uh, serious medical conditions. It was the state-owned enterprises that, that were able to provide the kind of scale of operation that also included medical care on site. And some of our facilities had um, a medical team on site to provide for some of these needs as we try to understand how do we need to manage some of the more, um, more challenging cases in terms of disabilities or cancer patients. If we look at employment, in the initial days, we anticipated that the crisis would be brief, that the war would end. Uh, but as weeks were on um, and more of Ukraine was destroyed, it became clear that even if the war ended soon, the refugees that we were hosting wouldn't really have a place to return to. So it became clear that we needed a plan for the long term. So as of right now, 350 Ukrainian refugees have been officially employed in Moldova. Uh, the government made an exemption from certain employment laws or uh, requirements for Ukrainian refugees during the state of emergency so they could be employed faster. And I sent a letter to all of the state-owned enterprises and requesting the list of open jobs, the openings that they have, so that we could start publishing all of these openings and start placing these lists in various housing centers so that people can identify some of the good matches for their skills and be able to find a job and provide for their family. On the, on the left, you can see in this picture, it's a picture of Galina, who uh, for the last month has been, has been working in a garment factory in Soroka in the north of Moldova. She's an accountant from Odessa. Uh, she was an accountant for seven years, but uh, the war brought her with her parents to Moldova and they only planned to stay only a short period of time and cross the country, keep moving on, but they ended up settling here. So being from a foreign country, so she was happy that she was able to find a job, earn money and help her parents. And she is able to do that because of some of these changes. In terms of finance, um, I imagine that you know, this event being hosted by LSE numbers are something you're very familiar with and interested in. Um, so we can talk about financial as the financial aspect of the this crisis for a bit. The Ministry of Finance, uh, and the website here is mf.gov.md, opened immediately an account where people from anywhere can donate money or transfer funds. And so far, about over 4 million euros have been donated uh, since the account was opened. And this money is used to support and pay for the expenses in these uh, refugee centers and to support them with any supplies that they need and also pay for transportation and other uh, things that were required. And I, I, would, I don't know about you, but typically I would be very reluctant to trust a government uh, entity or uh, especially in Eastern Europe uh, with handling some of these issues, but um, it, it's been incredible, the transparency and the openness and the publication of all the information that comes from this, this agency, this uh, ministry, and people uh, gained the trust of, of the government to be able to send their money uh, to them and make, uh, make these donations. And additionally, um, about 40 million euros in humanitarian aid arrived in the country through international nonprofits. The United Nations High Commission for Refugees offers about 112 euros to each refugee per month. Uh, with this money, the refugees can pay for uh, an apartment rental if they have one or pay for any expenses. As you can imagine, refugees arrived here with little food, with little clothing. They came here in the winter time when it's really cold. Now they have a time when it's warming up outside. They need a new set of clothes. They need school supplies. They need various things. And it's very helpful that 
they are able to get these refugee centers vouchers for uh, for grocery stores that some of the nonprofits are distributing and the railway uh, provided one of the locations to be able to have large numbers of people to come and receive these vouchers in the last couple of days. So what's next? Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, both in Ukraine and in Moldova. The number of refugees entering the country has sharply declined recently, but we're preparing for a few scenarios. We may need longer term education and employment options for the refugees that are here and providing access to preschools will facilitate mothers entering the workforce. We also need to plan for university students whose studies have been derailed and they may want to continue them. Secondly, we're aware that further military attacks on Odessa in the south of Ukraine, which is only 30 kilometers from the border, will likely mean another large influx of refugees. And we hope that the worst of the refugee crisis is behind us, but we're aware that uh, more waves of violence in Ukraine may cause us to ramp up capacity again. And we're always keeping that contingency in mind. And thirdly, based on instability in Transnistria, we're seeing Transnistrians cross to the right of the Nistru, uh, beginning to seek housing, employment, and schooling for their kids. And it's entirely possible that Kishinev may uh, see an influx of internally displaced persons coming across the Nistru to find greater stability. So I want to talk briefly about some of the things that we learned uh, through this experience. And I think one of the key things that uh, we learned is that we need to uh, focus on the mission of these enterprises, of these agencies, and keep redefining it. And when I talk about the mission here, it's really, it has to focus on the build, you know, bringing value for all stakeholders. And it's easy for us to think about enterprises as having key stakeholders as the state or customers or employees. But in this situation, we need to expand that notion to understand that it, there's also a social responsibility um, and a social care element that our activity has. And we need to be able to, to care for the people who are in need um, and be able to provide the funds and the infrastructure and the level of services that they need. So normally when I visit various companies here, it's a visit to the uh, power plant I challenge the CEOs and the employees of these organizations to focus on generating a greater value for our nation, you know, not simply use their role or connections to enrich themselves, which was the case in many years through various cases of corruption. But I'm trying to challenge them that they need to build a legacy for the next generation, build a value in their enterprises that will benefit all citizens of the country. So adding value today means also using compassion and empathy to deliver this valuable service services to the people who are today in need, who are our neighbors. And I want the mission of the public property agency uh, to be a good steward of the nation's assets. But there's a dichotomy here that on one hand, we need strong state-owned enterprises to deliver goods and services to people, and especially in a time of crisis and at this large scale. But we also don't want them to become monopolies, and we don't want them to make it difficult for smaller companies to grow, prosper, and develop. So we need to be better stewards when we understand the uh, larger number of stakeholders here. We also needed to pivot and accelerate uh, change that otherwise we may have been reluctant to accept. As the war came close to us, we needed to develop new capabilities and competencies. For example, we needed to figure out how to do gas trading, how to do gas storage, how to do energy efficiency. In this picture, you can see the Krikova winery. We need to figure out what are the new markets for Moldovan wines? What areas can we go? Who are, are our new partners? And how do we also expand the labor pool? How can we make use of the uh, opportunity that we have skilled labor, labor essentially coming from Ukraine into Moldova for a period of time? There's also a, an opportunity for transfer of skills and purpose. And some of, the C, some of these companies that we have in our portfolio learned that their skills are transferable and ap applicable in other areas that they haven't thought before. For example, Malt Expo has 50 employees that, who know how, very well how to organize trade shows and manage all logistics associated with that activity. But I couldn't think of a better team of people who knew how to manage large groups of people coming and going to their facility, 
providing food and cleaning services and running essentially a daycare on the premises. And the glass factory, you expect to be proficient in making glass, but yet they turn out to be amazing at making wood pallets and providing large quantities of them uh, where it was needed really fast. And I would never think of a winery being a great transportational uh, logistics hub, but yet they, they were able to provide uh, those tools that we needed at the right time. Uh, we needed to expand collaboration. We needed to be more effective at what we needed. But to do that, we needed to have access to people who knew how to do this. So through this, through this challenge, we relied on some of the international experts to come and teach us, for example, how to do energy trading. Uh, even though Ukraine, uh, a lot of the op operation in Ukraine was disrupted, we relied on some of our Ukrainian counterparts uh, to help us understand how we can do some of the uh, trading platforms that we can use all kinds of um, goods to be and services to be placed for uh, public public um, trying to think of the English word uh, the uh, auctions public auctions for example for uh, for metal, uh, auctions uh, use metal. And we, it was also a great test for weaknesses. Uh, when the system is stressed, you quickly find out what things are not working properly. And when there's a high level of anxiety, people tend to be discouraged. They tend to be uh, frustrated. But this is a learning opportunity for, for Moldova, for the government, and for state-owned enterprises to understand what are the things that we needed to adjust when there was a greater stress placed on all of our operations? And this is an opportunity for us to develop that resiliency and crisis management and reorient in a way that really builds that strength that we needed in the long term. And as people, as I mentioned, are going through this element of anxiety and frustration, leaders needed to engage in greater le uh, level of sense making. We need to sort of paint the picture for them and to explain to them how we're actually making progress, how we're learning new things, how we're developing, and how the fact that we are helping large groups of people who are neighbors, who are brothers and sisters, uh, is, gonna be, is gonna be changing us, is gonna be changing who you are as business partner, who you are as neighbors, who you are as, as uh, friends, essentially. And even though everybody does not get enough sleep, everybody is struggling, uh, what we're becoming is worth to go through this experience if we can learn from it, if we can have that sense of purpose. So I, I make it a priority to tell my employees at various companies and in the agency that, that this, we, can, we can have a great level of benefit through this experience and build a new resilience. And ultimately, it's about painting that future. Uh, previously, people would look at Moldova and just not see a great value be frustrated with the great levels of corruption or this uh, uncertainty about whether it's going to be aligned with Russia or the West. And today we can take that, that this is a picture from one of my friend's uh, workshops who's a painter, and you can see that this dry paint is nothing, but it was used to create a masterpiece. It was used to create something beautiful. So we can take this, this middle, in, in the middle of this crisis, in the middle of this brokenness, uh, we, can, we can see that we can come on the other end in a way that we're going to be better, we're going to be stronger, we're going to be closer to one another. On this, I want to end and take some questions. Um, uh, I would love to hear some of the feedback and some of the questions that you may have to fill in some gaps or uh, provide any more information. Thank you very much, uh, Eugenio, for this uh, heartwarming daily account of difficulties, of challenges, and uh, also ways to, um, to address them. Um, this has been a huge and unexpected uh, challenge to a government that uh, had a number of challenges, uh, as you mentioned, even before the COVID crisis, the energy crisis that was preceding and now has gotten worse, uh, not just in uh, Moldova, but uh, in all of Europe, I should, uh, should note. So many, many uh, challenges uh, beyond uh, the, the refugees, which in terms of human element and importance for the country and actually for, for Europe is clearly the, the biggest one. 
But uh, with that came uh, yet another uh, challenge um, to you and your agency and your government, which is the prospect of uh, fast track EU accession. So some of the early questions uh, um, raise, uh, I guess, a bit of a lack of understanding exactly what this means. Um, are you able actually to focus on this? Are you in fact in the process of doing some work? So if you can explain a bit um, to um, some of our uh, listeners, participants, um, what that means and does it actually mean that now in some sense you are tripling your efforts because you need to do your regular job, the refugee um, work that you mentioned and have started already on this new task or is this a task that is coming in, in the future? Can you explain a bit? The great opportunity that Moldova had by electing a, a pro-Western party to parliament, uh, having a pro-Western president and now government means that there's a, there's a unity of purpose in all major institutions of the state. So we're no longer trying to figure out uh, which way are we going and what's our future. As I mentioned, you know, we need to be building this future and, and painting uh, that our future prospects. And the mandate from the voters was very clear that our future is in the European Union. And while Moldova is not new to making the statement, only this year it has become a true reality because uh, there, was, there was a political mandate to be able to execute on these promises and this, these aspirations uh, for the country. As I mentioned in one of the lessons learned is that crisis accelerates your ability to, your, your necessity to pivot and turn and develop in new ways. And this crisis gave us this opportunity to fast track our application for European Union membership. And we received the questionnaires. There have been two questionnaires. The first one has already been completed and submitted to the European Union a few weeks ago, I believe. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, right now we're completing the second questionnaire, will be, uh, will be completed soon. The questionnaire has essentially many questions about the, uh, the, the structure of, of the country, some of the data that we have. Uh, we had to provide, for example, some information about state-owned enterprises and the, the plan for various activities that we wanted to do and have done in that uh, sector of the economy. And that's, that's one great element to see progress in that area. It gives people hope, it gives people understanding uh, that they know the direction of the country. And that I think provides some stability, both in terms of political, but also, also emotional sense that people know what the future holds for them. So this is a great hope to be in the European Union. Indeed, those of us who've entered the European Union uh, previously being in uh, the former Soviet bloc, um, like Bulgarians like myself, have experienced uh, the many benefits of uh, EU entry. Although um, I must warn you, the path to EU accession is very, very long and difficult. Hopefully, uh, in your case, it would be short, but it certainly would be difficult. So. Uh, uh, I guess this is where the question uh, was going, that in essence, you are dealing with a triple crisis at the same time. This is an opportunity, not a crisis EU accession, but it is still uh, a very significant amount of, um, of uh, work. Another set of questions uh, uh, bring us back to the refugee crisis. Uh, and one uh, specific question from Paul is, um, uh, how has been your experience uh, in meeting these challenges uh, while dealing with local authorities? So mayors, county presidents, have you had in your work uh, this, uh, let's say, opportunity or need to work with local authorities? And if so, uh, you're mentioning that uh, <laughs> traditional weaknesses, I imagine that can be one uh, difficulty. Can you explain a bit about this? Yeah, that's a great question. Local authorities have been some of the early responders and some, some key players in managing this crisis because, of course, all of the localities around the border where people were entering uh, immediately used uh, the housing options in those villages and those towns. And as, as the city sort of swelled with a number of refugees and buses started taking people to other centers, 
it was very important that local authorities would be engaged in helping us understand, are there any schools, for example, for, for large housing center? Are there summer camps that can be converted into, in, into those centers as well? And what are the local resources? Uh, and, and people from Ukraine had relatives in the villages and other places. So local mayors and uh, heads of regions are reaching out to the central government asking for more support as the crisis goes on because they, uh, they have fewer options and the refugees are starting to come to them and asking for a greater level of support. So the Ministry of Labor and Social Assistance uh, is the key ministry that manages that relationship with local authorities in terms of providing uh, various supplies uh, and funding for them. And, and Honestly, if we talk about the next wave of refugees, the odds are that local authorities will play a greater role in providing those spaces for a large wave if you, if you was to come in, because we're more or less running out of large spaces that, for example, my agency uh, has in, in, in our administration. But uh, there's, there are more smaller spaces scattered across the country and we'll be relying on the local authorities to be able to guide us in how to provide the necessary space if there's a larger group coming in. Thank you. Um, the next set of question is, questions is uh, more specific to the work of your, let's say the regular work of your, of your agency. Um, so you have just given us a number of uh, examples of uh, different uh, state-owned enterprises that uh, have worked together to address uh, one or more of the components of the refugee crisis. This perhaps longer term uh, gives you and the uh, managers of these uh, enterprises ideas of how to increase value for the enterprises or the combination of enterprises. Uh, so one of our um, participants is wondering whether this uh, then uh, di directs your attention and perhaps the direction of the agency overall towards new ways to think of privatization or of, uh, the usage of state assets um, uh, in different ways in, uh, into the future. I guess privatization now is uh, not uh, foremost on your mind, but has this crisis, let me ask the question this way, has this crisis perhaps uh, brought your thoughts in uh, ways uh, that uh, you didn't have before in how to use more effectively state assets? Yeah, this is a great question. I think we have to go back to the mission and purpose of why we have state-owned enterprises, because we have to have a very clear reasoning of why the state uh, controls certain assets. And as I mentioned before, if you look at the, the ratio of Ukrainian refugees who relied on private homes, uh, private hotels, it's about 90%. And only 10% needed uh, something more centralized, maybe greater level of medical care, a specific access for disability or other things. And that's where the state enterprises were great at providing a service at a maybe larger scale and in a, in a way that addressed a social need in a way that private enterprises couldn't. And you can make, you can make that parallel to the economy where there are certain areas where private enterprises have a hard time uh, developing um, their business in that area. For example, let's say an airport. Uh, I mean, you're not going to be building many private airports in Moldova because it's just the, the scale is too big or a new railway. So there's certain assets that have to be strategically used by the government while the state needs to support private enterprises developing. If we look at the, the assets and the portfolio of the, the PPA, it's very clear that there are certain companies that would be very successful if they own private hands and the state does not need to be in those vertical industries. So one of the, one of the key goals for, for our country is to develop that national strategy for uh, state-owned enterprises and what's going to be the next level of privatization and how to do that transparently, how to do that clearly, 
And the focus is going to be immediately on building the value in this company. So at the right time, with the right strategy, we have a clear path to how to maintain the necessary presence of government influence in certain vertical industry verticals while letting go others so that private enterprises can develop in a way that provides better services, better products for the population. So looking at that perfect ratio, I guess, of where the state needs to be able to provide essential services for social good, essentially, uh, while letting private enterprise do what it does best, and that is to innovate, uh, have strong, healthy competition, and be able to, to develop uh, in ways that enable us to be present on various markets as we inch closer towards the European Union and need to become more competitive because that's the key for our long-term survival and uh, presence in that community. Indeed, thank you. We have time for one uh, more question. So I'll combine uh, two of the uh, existing questions on the topic of energy and uh, well, state-owned enterprises and energy. So mm. your energy sector, uh, a fairly large share of it is in, uh, in your hands, so to speak, in state-owned enterprises. Uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of this uh, public event, uh, this was a challenge even prior to the war in Ukraine, but has become a much bigger challenge uh, uh, in many European uh, uh, countries, but uh, particularly in countries like Moldova that uh, do depend uh, to a significant uh, uh, degree of um, gas from Russia, in general, the links to, uh, to, the, uh, to the war are much, uh, much bigger. Uh, just a few words of how much uh, is this taking out of your time and your sleep? Um, what are the challenges that you're currently dealing with? in this area of energy and uh, state-owned enterprises? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, this was one of the crises that uh, uh, we had to deal with uh, for a while now. Previous administrations relied on the stability of contract with a single supplier from Russia. And what we learned is that true stability and a good service for our people requires diversification of energy sources. And we're looking at the energy sector. And as you mentioned, we're spending uh, a lot of time uh, currently dealing with these issues because we're in the middle of negotiations for a new electric power contract. We are also uh, in negotiations uh, for, for the gas contract. Um, and we are also looking at energy supply options from, from the internal market. So we have about 20% of our energy supply comes from, from our own sources, uh, of which I think 10 to 15% is renewable energy from what we produce in Moldova. So we're looking at the energy market from the perspective of diversification of energy sources. We're trying to develop the capability. We are working at developing that capability of becoming an energy trader for one of our state-owned enterprises in Nergocom. And we are looking at a large scale in terms of policy. We're looking at energy efficiency uh, at a national level. Uh, for example, we have a thermal power plant and the more houses are connected to the central heating system, uh, the more power is generated uh, through this power plant, which means uh, we can have lower cost of thermal or for hot water, uh, which in turn generates uh, cheaper electricity. So we want to have as a national policy, the public uh, office buildings, public spaces, schools, uh, government buildings to be connected to the central heating system as well as uh, expanding that to various businesses. So we're looking at energy efficiency, we're looking at diversification um, and building our own capability to be able to think in new creative ways, which also includes renewable energy. And that means uh, wind and solar uh, through various SOEs are looking at the options for solar farms that would uh, supplement their energy needs. 
Thank you again. Yeah, I'm sure that this is a topic that will uh, be with you and with us for some um, for some time, as uh, all of Europe is actually grappling with how to diversify, reorient in a very short period of uh, time. In some countries, shorter than others, like in Moldova, my own country, Bulgaria, was switched off on the Russian side from gas. So we also rushing to figure abruptly, yes. Um, so we are also um, trying to figure out how to how to deal with this. So great uh, difficulties, but as you say, great difficulties also. Uh, bring some solutions that we wouldn't have um, uh, had uh, before. So I want to wish you from our, all, all of our participants, both at LSC and people listening to us from around uh, the world, uh, good luck with all of this, uh, addressing all of these uh, challenges. And I hope that in a few months, we can have you again as a lecturer, this time perhaps in London, to tell us about EU accession and how uh, you and your agency and indeed your whole government is dealing with this uh, great opportunity, but yeah. also a, a difficult path to um, getting, uh, getting there. So again, uh, thank you for giving us the time. We know that you're quite uh, busy with the crises, um, not just refugees, but energy uh, as well. And uh, just a reminder to all of our participants, uh, subject to technology being on our side, we would uh, have this uh, recording uh, put on uh, the website very soon as, uh, as a podcast. Uh, and you see here our website where the podcast will be, uh, will be available. Thank you very much for everybody who uh, attended. Good evening for those of you in Europe. And, um, a nice afternoon for those of you who, as I see, have joined like myself from, uh, from the Americas. Thank you very much uh, and goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.